we get this one from this ecce homo, the Latin phrase spoken by a Latin official, makes sense. But in the Greek of John's Gospel, idu ho anthropos. I'm not just being um, fancy by giving you that. The Greek, the reason I wanted you to see the Greek is because the word in Greek, anthropos, is, is gender neutral, so to speak. It's, a, it's actually a, a masculine noun, but it doesn't mean male or female. It means human being. So we have two different words. We have a word for aner is a male, and une in, is a woman in, in, in Greek. So we have nouns for those. John does not give us, behold, the male. That's really important. He says, behold, the man or the human. He could have easily said, Behold humanity. Behold human being. So this is a point of manifestation in the Gospels. By that, I mean, that's where Jesus is displayed before the world. The persecuting, crucifying world. Um, which includes all of us, <laughs> as, as we'll see in just a moment. So the theological point I wanted you to take away from this is that the Ecce Homo series, and particularly the one I think effectively and the one that I'm going to tell you about, the sculpture, um, presents us not just with an historical episode, but a picture, a story even, of what human being ought to look like. What human being as created in the image and likeness of God looks like in this violent chaotic, war-loving world. So, that's why I gave you the Greek. In the Latin, it's just ecce homo. It's a little bit easier. Let's look at a couple of examples of this theme, this motif throughout history. It becomes popular in the 15th century, so you've got good old Hieronymus Bosch. You all, you all know Hieronymus Bosch. Completely wacky. I mean, he, he, you would think that the guy was on some form of you know, medieval dope, because he, so it, particularly when he picks, uh, depicts hell or heaven, there's some really bizarre stuff. The Garden of Earthly Delights, you probably remember that from, from high school, maybe. Um, anyway, this is Bosch's rather sedate, compared to some of his other works, um, depiction of this scene, the Eke Homo scene. This is, you can go to Boston and see this one if you like. Um, there you have Jesus, crown of thorns, the robe. You can see, but Bosch is great at making mocking figures, uh, people who just look like just nasty. And so, if you could see this closer, you might see some of these um, types of faces in the crowd. Um, from Bosch, we go ahead to this is a Dutch painter in the early 16th century. Here's a very Boschian sort of face. Here. Monty. Monty. Yeah. Monty. 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 Did you? Oh. Yeah. Y'all remember that? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. A lot of them that works that way. This one's from, from the Prado in Madrid. Here you get a, a similar, you know, as the viewer of this painting, you're in a similar perspective. You're kind of looking, uh, you know, this one you're looking head on. It's almost like an icon. You're directly. This one's at a bit of an angle. It's kind of interesting. Um, but there we have the, the Man of Sorrows, Pilate, presumably. Uh, I guess Pilate is the bearded dude, maybe. Um, and the crowd and the jeering, mocking soldiers. I think you, this is, I think Mom talked about this one already, so I won't even try to add anything to what she said. So this is Caravaggio's. Um, uh, okay, Caravaggio's uh, famous depiction, and probably the most famous uh, modern painter, uh, a modern version of this thing. What's striking about this one? Youth. Youth? Yeah. Youth of Jesus' body, yeah? Light. Like Caravaggio, it's all about the light for him. Yeah, brilliant. What else? Yeah, It'd be, unlike the Bosch and the Metzis one we saw. Yeah, there's a real empathy there. Yeah, so it's like, 
almost like the centurion or something. There's a sort of affection or a, a care, I think was a good word to use, in the, the figure behind Jesus. And the other fellow looks like he's saying, guilty or not guilty? Yeah. yeah. Who is this guy? Yeah. Don't know. I mean, who is the actual person on the right? I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on this painting, I it was. But here he's giving you the, he's enacting the whole ecce homo. Behold the man. He's pointing to him. This, this painting, I think, compels a response. It, it demands one. Um, who do you say that I am in Jesus' word? That is really the, when I was talking about the fancy theological debates in the 4th and 5th century around um, the Mediterranean, that was the question. Who do you say that I am? That's, I think, the question that's being posed to us by this figure on the right, very powerfully, very directly. Um, Caravaggio was a character, too. I mean, one of my favorite painters. I don't know anything about Antonio Cesare, but I do love this, um, this very dramatic kind of 19th century, I think, um, version of this same scene. But interestingly, we're put, this almost a cinematic um, quality to it. And I mean, this the, the the pose of Jesus here, and we're seeing Pilate from behind, almost like we're looking out at the crowd from Pilate's perspective. That's a little more troubling, um, in many ways. Pilate's wife, who you know, the legend is uh, that Pilate's wife became a Christian after this scene. We don't know, but that's one one tradition. Um, I like this painting just for the sheer dramatic value of it. I don't know if it's the best theologically, but I, I think it's a really uh, interesting painting. Uh, so I'm going to try to pronounce this guy's name, Albert Kmielowski. Any, any Polish speakers in here? Did I get it close? Okay. He was a monk, um, and he's since been canonized, Roman Catholic monk in Poland. Um, born in the late 19th century, and was also a, a painter. And um, this is his version of the same theme. And again, we're back to the kind of iconic stance of being confronted with the simple reality of the suffering, persecuted, mocked, abused, I mean, tortured, really. You, this is quite a graphic image. I don't know if you can see it from way back there, but um, the, the scars on Jesus' flesh are quite uh, tangible. Um, and this face, this sort of haunting, um, dark face. And again, this sort of theme from the iconographers, a little gold here and there, but it's just, it's not a blaze of gold, it's just... I think the point that Kimielowski um, is trying to get at here is this is the moment when divine and human Jesus are manifest to the world. This is the moment when the incarnation reaches its most intense crystallization. This is what it means for God to become man. This is also what it means for human beings to become God. Now that sounds really weird. I know. That sounds really weird. It makes, might even make you uncomfortable. What do you mean? We're not supposed to become God. Well, no. But, uh, going back to Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, it was Athanasius who was slightly earlier, Athanasius of Alexandria, one of the great church fathers, who put it like this. He said that God became man in order that man might become God. The purpose of the Incarnation for Athanasius is to unite us to the divine nature, to unite us to God himself. And indeed, he would go even so far as to say, to make us God, or to make us participate entirely in the divine reality. Participating in the divine reality, becoming one with God, which is the destiny of all creatures. In this world, looks like that. I think you know there's a deliberate refusal of this sort of pretty Jesus um, in this painting. That 
the reality of the world that we live in is this is what true a, a human life lived most humanly and most divinely for Athanasius those would be the same thing to live life in a most human way is to live it like Jesus Jesus is the human being ha anthropos His, this is sort of the image image form of what a full human life looks like right I really need a lanyard or something. <laughs> uh, and again, we get the same type of. Um, I'm sorry if I've been blocking you all this whole time from the, from the Democrat side. Republicans can see fine. I, whenever I use that for undergraduates, they don't they don't get the. Whole thing. So, what? Yeah. So. Um, Anyway, this is Georges Rouault, a great French Catholic painter from the 20th century. This is one of my favorite paintings, um, not just of this theme, but of, of, of anything. Rouault was um, particularly uh, interested, not to say obsessed, with the, uh, the suffering of Jesus. He did a whole series on called Miserere, which he did sort of depictions of Jesus. In, um, this incredibly sorrowful, somber tone. But it's also these unbelievably vibrant colors. Rouault has two favorite subjects as a painter. They are Jesus and clowns. Hmm. You know this, yeah. His paintings of clowns. And there's a, re there's a <coughs> theological connection between those two things, between clowns and Jesus. I'm not going to try to figure that out right now. But for Rouault, it was there was a logical connection between these two. I mean, Jesus is almost like a clown in this painting. Because this is foolishness. This is complete foolishness. It's Paul's language, not mine. So don't throw tomatoes at me. Yet. Now, this is the sculpture I wanted to talk about. In 1999, the City of London commissioned three different artists to produce a work of art to occupy the vacant fourth plinth of Trafalgar Square. How many of you have been to Trafalgar Square? So, describe Trafalgar Square to me. Pigeons. Sorry? Pigeons, yes. Pigeons. Sorry? Big, it's very large. Thronged with tourists in the summertime. Lions. What is in the middle of Trafalgar Square? A gigantic obelisk mounted with the figure of Admiral Nelson, victorious over Napoleon in the Battle of Waterloo, English hero. I, think, I wish I had a picture that gave you the scale here because um, that it must be a hundred feet high. It's huge and it dominates the skyline. You can see it. And by the way, if you're looking from the north end of Trafalgar Square, which is the National Gallery of Art. You look down Whitehall, um, past Lord Nelson, you'll see the House of Parliament. So this is, like, this is the center of power in the United Kingdom. Literally the seat of power in you know, the throne of Her Majesty is a stone's throw from this spot. So there are, there are, there are sculptures on all of each of the other three plants in Trafalgar Square. But this one, this the fourth one, has been vacant for forever. So they did this competition, not a competition, but they, they had a commissioned a series of artists to do something there. Nobody talks about the other two that appeared in 1999. But this one struck uh, a nerve. Um, first of all, as a matter of scale, it's about my size, so it's a life-size human. It's, um, I think it's actually plaster, it looks like marble. It's, well, what, you tell me, what, what features strike you as the, the way that Mark Wallinger, who's not a Christian, as far as I know, I don't know much about the rest of his work, but something compelled him to do this. I think he is, yeah. Yeah, I don't think he's a believer 
I, I, you might even be a, you know, a dissenter. Um, doesn't really matter, I think, for this this particular work. It looks very airy to me. Like, that's what I was thinking. Should have been in some I, place I was that thinking Hitler Europe. Youth. Interesting. I don't know why. Yeah. Well, okay. Then. Bold. Yeah. It doesn't look like a first-century Palestinian. That's true. But it's also white marble, or a, a, a substance meant to look like white marble. So it echoes the sculptural tradition from ancient Greece. This is this, this style of sculpture is very much like that. In Rome, but the Romans stole everything from the Greeks anyway. So, um, what else? He looks like a perfect British citizen. Interesting. How so? Pa pasty white? Is that what you mean? <laughs> sort of, but thin. Uh, short hair. Uh, it's, it's just his stature, his posture. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can you describe what's on his head? It's actually a gold crown of thorns. In gold. His hands appear to be bound behind his back. Yes. Nope. Nope. You can't see any visible wounds. Not overfed. Yes. Or overdressed. Or overdressed. <laughs> of course, this is a traditional way of depicting Jesus, just yeah. at, the, at the crucifixion, just the tunic. Clean and pure. Yeah. I think one of the things about this sculpture, it was very controversial at the time. It still is. Let me put it to you this way. After it was removed, as a temporary exhibit, but after it was removed, it was put in, the, I think, the tape gallery or the Tate Modern, um, with, I think it's still there, or some smaller gallery. <coughs> and it's a different work of art in a museum than on the fourth plant at Trafalgar Square. It's a different work of art. Context makes a very big difference. Why'd they take it off? Well, it was, it was only a temporary uh, sort of, for the millennium, they had these, you know, three rotating displays. And they still use this. They have, ever since then, uh, they will do these rotating exhibits there. So the fourth plinth, you know, you could go today and there'll be something. Go six months from now, there'll be something. Else. So it's like a, it's like an an outdoor, you know, art site. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, it was 1999. So this is right before the millennium, and then a lot of activity going on. Um, anybody else? Does anybody find this image disturbing? How so? Okay. All right. Good. Anybody else? Else not warm up to the image. I think that's a good way of putting it because I think in many ways that's deliberate on the part of the artist. Does it have anything to do with the artist's intention or the Well, I don't know. I'll tell you why I think this is a profoundly Christian representation of this scene. And it doesn't matter for me whether or not the artist believes or not. He's captured something essential about Christ in this sculpture. And I think it would help if you could see that, you know, if, we, if I had a better picture where you could see the scale, how small this is. Think about it. This is Jesus, Christos Pantocrator, the ruler of the universe, being completely overshadowed by a naval admiral. Staring down Whitehall at the halls of power, at the seat of empire. That cannot be accidental. Um, I think the, the power of this piece, to me, has less to do with the actual way in which Wallinger has depicted the face and so forth, the absence of scars. 
as it does with the relationship between this work and its surroundings. And in that sense, to me, this, this sculpture captures the absurdity of the incarnation, the absurdity of, of the crucifixion. And by, I don't mean to put that too strongly by saying absurdity, but what I think it gets at better than maybe any of the other ones, this, you don't need the Greek unless you really want it. 1 Corinthians 1, which I'm sure you all know. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. I want you to have an image of that Jesus, that you know, sort of smallish, marble Jesus, on a plinth, by the way, that is completely out of proportion with the actual figure. It's much bigger. I mean, there's a, there's a disproportionality at work in this piece of art that is, I think, very important. It looks tiny on this plinth. It calls for, a, the size of the surface calls for a much, much bigger <coughs> sculpture. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, that's sort of a jab at the Greeks, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, and this is the most important line, one of Paul's finer moments, if they say so, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. I think that Wallinger sculpture captures the essence of this passage from Paul's epistle to the Corinthians better maybe than any of the others we have looked at. Precisely because of the power of the context. You know, I wish I had been able to see this um, in person. I, I, I wasn't. But the, the oversized... Um, Nelson statue, for example. Not that he, Ed Nelson is not an admirable person and someone who ought to be praised for military virtue or whatever, nobility, whatever. But what Paul is saying is all of that is foolishness to God. That the, the, the little man that you saw on the plinth that everybody ignores and noted, and they're all looking up at Nelson, or they're looking down at the Houses of Parliament at Westminster, or they're looking at the pigeons, or they're looking at the lions, or all the tourists with their cameras. The point, I think, that that is, that is the center of the universe. This is the, the meaning of human existence, is this figure, represented by this, this sculpture. This is complete foolishness. I think... Um, I think it captures that. Oh, beautiful! Yeah, you know, pass that around or something. You, you get a sense of how um, how the scale here is. And again, I think it's something that is hard to even put into words. It's something that just has to be sort of seen or experienced, perhaps, or at least imagined. The idea of the contradiction involved between two notions of power. Yes. How did the artist describe his culture? I have no idea. I do know that the, 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 the sort of, the one thing that was important to him was the notion of judgment. Like, this figure stands in judgment of the world. It is the, not the other way around. That's the paradox of Ecce Homo. Like, here's Christ being judged by the powers of this world. The irony is that in the act of crucifixion, it is not Jesus who is being judged. It is the world. The world is judged and condemned, but also redeemed and saved by this action. They forgive them, they know not what they do. It is, another way, another way of putting it is, this is the overturning of every worldly concept of power, of military might, prestige, influence, wealth, whatever. 
What power looks like in Christian terms is that. That's what power, but also that's what human being looks like in the divine image. This is what we are called to look like. Yeah? Well, and I think this is that is an exceptionally important point because um, the, the New Testament, it, I mean, the Jews themselves, you know, our whole history of the Old Testament, God's covenant with Israel, is about a flawed people who have no reason to be chosen by God. But that's the way God is. God chooses the small things of this world to humble the proud. And God is weird like that. God is not like Zeus. I mean, there's a reason why Paul is sort of nudging at the Greeks. Because the Greeks would find this idea bizarre. That the divine is realized, is manifest in this world in suffering, in death, in torture, in obedience, even unto death. And then, he, and then he comes just by being locked down in a pile of straw. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the incarnate from the moment of nativity to the crucifixion, it is the small things of this world, the small people of this world, that God uses, in Paul's language, to shame the wise. So, I think if you feel, if you feel conflicted by this sculpture, then you're looking at it in the right way. If you feel like, Ugh, that hurts a little bit, that I think is is one of one of the things that for me makes this such an effective <coughs> contribution to the history of this motif throughout um, several centuries. Oh, sorry, I was about to sell it to you too. So, what yeah. what would have it been like for people of faith communities that um, live where there is a state church to see such defiance in this image? I mean, we don't in this country we don't really know what that's like, and so that power that's a block away is also the church. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so this really uncomfortable for yeah. the bishops who sit in the House of Lords, you know, who. Um, uh, there, that, I think that that's not accidental. I think that Wallinger probably means to be making a point to them too. And yes, there is a state church, um, but you know, the United Kingdom is what, like three percent regular church attendance these right. days. So it's a cultural thing. But I think what's cool about this is like here you have an atheist. Let's call him an atheist. I think that's fair who is showing something about the truth of the Christian gospel that maybe the rest of us have kind of, you know, polished over a little bit. Thomas Kincaided over a little bit. With apologies, I'm sure this is not a Thomas Kincaid crowd. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's all sweetness and light. The, the they, can, they can do that unabashedly. I mean, that's, that's the gift of, yeah. of taking something and leaving the rest. I mean, that's... Yeah. Uh, oh, that we in the faith community would do it in similar ways. Or something so radical and kind of, I mean, in a way this looks really radical, really controversial, but it's no more controversial than the gospel itself, which is extremely controversial in the, to this world because it, it's a threat. I mean, that's, I think that, that, that kind of, this is a threat to our notions of power. If the humility is the greatest virtue. Is to be most fully human is to be humble.